I'm Kai Kawasaki, and this is Remarkable People. I'm on a mission to make you remarkable. Helping me in this episode is the remarkable Abraham Paskowitz. Abraham's father, Dorian, or Doc Paskowitz, was a Stanford-educated doctor who lived and served in Israel, Hawaii, California, and other fantastic places. Abraham was born in Hawaii and moved to California as a kid. He and his eight siblings grew up in a van that Doc and his third wife, Juliet, piloted around the United States in search of the perfect waves. In fact, the Paskowitz are considered the first family of surfing. Truly, it was a bohemian lifestyle because Doc rejected the notion of formal structured education. In 1972, Doc founded the first surf school in the United States. It operates to this day. Kelly Slater was once an instructor there. Abraham worked for several years as the global sales director for Carver Skateboards. He is now a co-owner of the skateboard company Hamboard and is a partner with Isaris Wetsuits. I have four, maybe five, maybe even six Isaris Wetsuits. They are, without question, one millimeter warmer than other wetsuits, meaning that a three millimeter Isaris is as warm as other four millimeter wetsuits. And the thinner the suit, the easier to paddle because the suit is less bulky. Indulge my passion for surfing in this episode. I'm Guy Kawasaki. This is Remarkable People. And now, here's the remarkable Abraham Paskowitz and the remarkable story of the first family of surfing. I've heard and read the rumors, but I want to hear it from you. Just <laughs> how exactly did you... And your family grow up. Tell me the story of Doc Paskowitz and the family. First, I just want to thank you for having me. And I, I kind of want to hear about the rumors, but uh, <laughs> whatever they are, they must be intense because it, it was intense. You know, I was growing up in a camper. It was pre-van life, it, it, except you have nine bodies and a mom and dad. So you've got all these siblings in this vehicle. And I think if you asked a few of my brothers that have alternate answers, but to me, it, it was always searching for the perfect place, the perfect wave. We would have our surf school at San Onofre. We would surf all summer from June till September, and then we'd get in the van and then we'd head off. And usually with no agenda. And we would go across, stop in El Paso, shoot all the way down to South Padre Island, go all along the coast. Doc always looked for these special waves. He looked at the topography and said, hey, maybe there could be a wave here. So he would go all the way across, all into Florida, surf all the way up the eastern seaboard, and then get to his sister and mom and dad that lived in New York City in Manhattan. And I tell you, we did that <laughs> again and again. I'd say for, in my lifetime, probably 15 years, 10 to 15 years. I mean, I, <clears throat> every summer, I and mean, we started to camp in 72, and we continued to do that until the early 80s. So instead of the endless summer, you had the endless year. Endless year. Well, the endless search, you know, it's like Doc was such a bohemian. He just wanted to to get out there. And he loved surfers and he loved being in their little environment. And in San Clemente Pier, he used to call them pier rats. In Waikiki, that's where he was part of the Beach Boys, right? So that's where he, he fell in love with this camaraderie that the surfers had. And he was a physician. So he was a Stanford doctor that could give back and really felt that reward for giving back to the surfers, whether it was stitching up a brada or pulling sea urchin out of his foot or just some positive mental attitude. And so he took all of that with him every single day. And he was one of those people you say, oh, like positive affirmations, but he was that as long as it met, had to do with diet the pillars of health in his book, Surfing in Health, he writes about the five pillars of health was diet, exercise, rest, which he also coined recreation, which that's where he got his 
exercise from surfing, that recreation, that positive out of attitude of mind. Um, so all that came from his experience with the family, but also took him 20 years to write the book. And that was all about being a part of what he loves so much. And that's a surfing community. And so instead of homeschooled, you were van schooled. So how did <laughs> education work? That's so funny. We always talk about being homeschooled, but there was no curriculum. There was no um, forethought. He wanted us to seek education in our own individual ways. So sometime the boys got old enough, especially David, Jonathan, Abraham, Israel, who were only a year apart, we would say we wanted to learn you know, math and reading and we're interested in science. And we always had books. So we always had available reading materials, but we wanted the traditional scholastic material. So we would, he'd say, okay, here's what you do. You write to U.S. government, the head of education, please ship books for the fourth grade, third grade, second grade to P.O. Box, General <laughs> Delivery, Portales, New Mexico, <laughs> Arizona, El Paso. So wherever where there's a general delivery, it, we would get there, there'd be a big box of books from the, the, the government, would send workbooks, scholastic workbooks. And that's where we would get our education and we would fill those books out. Of course, the brothers, you know, that always fighting like okay and the rule is never write in pen always write in pencil so you can erase the answers and next bro could have it like it was such a race to be better than each other so of course like israel or, or, or jonathan or some younger brother who was like a super genius would start filling in the answers right away and it's like, oh man and then we figure out a way how to cover those up and <laughs> but most of the and education we got was from Dorian inspiring us to find it ourselves, find what we love, do what you want, find what makes you feel affirmed each day. And that's what each of us are so unique is that everyone has their own special talent. And where was your mom in this? Obviously, she was not a tiger mom forcing you to take violin and learn calculus mm -mm. at five. So you could go to Dartmouth. So <laughs> <laughs> interesting enough. My, yeah, he saw it out the perfect mate, right? He has this unpublished book, this manuscript script called How to Choose a Mistress because <laughs> he believed that your wife should also be not just your, not, I, I hate to say like servant, but your, your partner, not just your life partner, but also someone that you wanted to like be with all the time. You know, so he had this really, really structured after two unsuccessful marriages, being a doctor in Honolulu, graduating Stanford, rushing into getting married, rushing into the typical normal life. He said, that's it. I'm never going to do that again. I'm going to find a wife with number one has to have older brothers. Number two, she has to be educated. She has to be tall. She has to be thin. She has to be athletic. <laughs> she, he had a list. Um, it's in that. And and where is this manuscript right now? Who it's it's I have one and my brother Moses <laughs> has one. But it's really hard to read because it kind of deals with the problems that America has with sexuality and how the rest of the world and he he refers to the Mongols uh sleeping all together and the mom and dad making love in the in the in the Ur europe or the tp and he talks about the indians how there was this society of the matriarch and the patriarch and how much they work together to show their children their love and affection and yeah i mean there's a part in the documentary surf wise where my brother salvador says oh my god and mom and dad would do it every night and so i had this little method where i folded my ears in on themselves and stuffed them into the inner <laughs> ear and i would hold my fans over the ear and so i couldn't hear them making love so to get back to your That's question the rumors though, i heard <laughs> you, you heard those rumors yeah it was all true it, it, because we lived together in a, such a tight compact area but there was so much you know when we were young it was really remarkable and Dorian sought 
out to find that perfect mate. And I remember the story is like, it really comes down to Dorian after you've been to Israel and, 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 and he's been cruising around as this lost individual doctor. He's working on Catalina Island as a doctor. He's walking around in board shorts, no shoes, no shirt, walks by a restaurant. He looks in the restaurant and there's my mom with her girlfriend. And my mom at the time had a master's degree in music and used to sing for the Roger Ragnar Chorale. So she was sitting there with her girlfriend and Doc looked over, he stared at her, he kind of stared back. He walked in, he stood right at her table. She's looking up at him, can I help you? <laughs> and he, he's staring, he doesn't, and he says, you have older brothers? Yes. <laughs> He says, what are you, you know, it starts asking the questions and then he, he, and no, no, no shit. He, he actually gave her all the questions and he, he said to her, I don't think I'm getting very far with you. And she said, ah, you could be getting farther than you know. <laughs> and then he said, well, then you might be the mother of my seven sons. <laughs> and she had eight. So he, he had the whole eHarmony questionnaire figured out way oh. before eHarmony. Basically. Absolutely. He just <laughs> knew what he wanted in a woman. He wanted a woman. He said, if, and he based it off nature and science and physiological development of the mother and breastfeeding and holding your child and nurturing your children and coddling on them and, and, and until a certain age, of course. But he would say, look, if a, a mama gorilla couldn't hold her baby and breastfeed from the tet until they were two years old, then my wife should be able to do the same. So he really had that deep comparison <laughs> to nature with everything, science, diet, health. If your kids came to you and said, Dad, <laughs> We're going to emulate grandpa. We're going to buy a van mm -hmm. and we're going to take our family and we're just going to go mm -hmm. with our kids, your grandkids. What would you tell them? Oh, wow. First of all, I, I do believe that, you know, you want to inspire kids to do what they love because they're going to go that way, I think, eventually. But first of all, I would, would encourage them to have some education, to actually get in there and go to college. And, and for my brother, Adam who has his family all on board with that homeschooling. And he was very successful, made a lot of money in the music industry. He took his kids around the world in a yacht. He took his kids around the, the, the nation in a camper for years. Now they're 15 and, and 13 and a couple of little ones on the way. So for him, it was great. But for me, I would encourage going to college, I would encourage them to get some education before they decide to go live like a Paskowitz. <laughs> Doc is rolling over in his grave right now. No, no you know what? He kind of knew that I wasn't like, I wasn't quite like the other brothers. You know, I was sandwiched between two amazing surfers that he just idolized. He idolized my brother, Izzy. He idolized my brother, Jonathan. And David just had his place at the old, oldest son as the, the captain of the ship, which when we got older and so incorrigible, David was his right-hand man, had to impose his will on us. So it was some strife between the oldest. But be between my older brother, Jonathan, and my younger brother, Israel, they became world champion surfers. He was really into their career. But for me, I wasn't that comfortable in the water. I wasn't comfortable in competition. I loved just free surfing. I loved being in, in the ocean and a part of that cosmic wave. And that was really re resonating with me. I did not like competition. I, I don't mind surfing with a crowd, but I'd rather go down to Oceanside, between Oceanside and San Onofre and surf by myself. I mean, that's just the kind of surfer that I am. And I, I was an oddball to him. He used to call me a goofball. <laughs> Let's transition to surfing hardcore as opposed to lifestyle. Yeah. So your family started the first surfing school in the world? There's some debate that there was an Aussie family that started, but in America, for sure. In the early 70s, and in fact, I see some of the ads in the old Surfer magazine. 
And in the seventies, every year we would go to San Onofre, would hang out and these cars would pull up next to us. And back in the day, you just kind of stay there most of the summer. And then we'd meet these families and people were very kind of like, what are you guys doing? You know, these structured exercises in the morning and, and a table looked like a surf school, but there's a, this is just the 11 of us having breakfast or we would have a Friday night Seder and singing the songs in Hebrew and people are like, what are they doing? What, what kind of like cult is this? <laughs> And so people came up to us in the early 70s and said, hey, my kid's been surfing with your kids for the last two, two or three days. Do you mind if they hang out? I'll give you some money for food. And yeah, all of a sudden we started doing overnight camps and then it grew and then it was weekly. And then it was like he called it the surfari. And it, it just to this day, we're still running surf schools down in San Diego now. But it used to be at San Onofre. And we would stay there all summer long teaching people to surf. And of course, the locals in San Clemente, they're like, what are you doing, Pasco? It's teaching surfers. You're going to get the crowded lineup. You're going to get the lineup too crowded. You're going to teach surfers? No, that's too elitist. Yeah. You know, what are you doing? But we always thought, and Doc always thought, if anybody wants to learn how to surf, they should learn how to do it right. Because the ocean will teach you. The ocean is the great equalizer, no matter who you are, you paddle out there and you're just flotsam on the water. If you don't watch what you're doing, you're going to get your, you know, <laughs> koholi kicked out of Even you. if you're Mark Zuckerberg and you got your electric surfboard with your zinc covered face, I mean... <laughs> I think he probably we could buy himself a pass from the ocean now, but I, I don't know. I I was never into like powered surfboards. I love the idea of, of evolution and the technology and like where surfing might go in a hundred years from now. But there's nothing more pure than just wearing your boardies, having your your board, no leash. And you just paddle out there in complete and utter control, and you're just a part of the ocean. Then what about surf ranches where you know exactly what's coming is going to be same and perfect every time? Does that take the challenge out of knowing where to position and all that kind of stuff that is true in the ocean? For me, like I, I think the surf ranch is part of the development of what they did back in scripts and the, and the early pioneers of surfing did. And my dad was part of that. And they tried to create a wave in a small pool, you know, and it was all about that hydro technology and that wave technology and how it would help to design boats that go faster and get through the swells faster and, and how the wave breaks and how it curls and how the offshores affects it and the tides and the bottom. And so there's a technology in that, that I, I think is very interesting and for me, I've never surfed the ranch, but if I did, it would be about probably stalling and getting in the barrel a long time. I would practice like one specific move that that wave can offer you besides the barrel, maybe a nice full roundhouse figure eight cutback. But I like the idea that you can create a stationary wave too, like the freestanding waves, they do that. I forget the name of those, but they have them in some of the boats, the pleasure boats. And there, there's one in um, in England and there's a few in Germany and it's just a freestanding wave. And it's just interesting. There's a river in Munich where that happens and naturally. Yeah. I've been to it. Yeah, it's really amazing. And to me, it's like anything that has to do with surfing, I'm all for. I think it's really interesting that guys can go out in, in wetsuits and surf in the rivers in, in, in Montana. There's guys that surf in Colorado. I just heard from one of the early pioneers of river surfing that there's an association in Ohio. I, I love that. And once the surfing got into the Olympics, I know my dad is just glowing up and then spreading the light and love of to all the surfers that were a part of the Olympics because he always thought that surfing could be a spectator sport. But I think the only way to make it a spectator sport would be to have it in a controlled environment with a huge coliseum looking down on that perfect wave. But I still, I believe that there's a space for that. If you were to use a figure skating analogy, it's not like figure skating is held on frozen rivers, right? <laughs> it's in a perfectly Zamboni surface. Yeah, but that's, and I think, I think just like snowboarding took a while to develop its judging criteria. I think the surfing needs that 
same criteria. And I think they're getting it. I think the last couple of events that WSL actually did it right, where you get the throwaway practice runs, and then you get um, two waves, two two runs, your highest score, you combine them. But what was interesting that you mentioned about the, I, figure skating is that figure skating has these technical rules, right? So there's the compulsory maneuvers and the artistic right. maneuvers. And Doc always thought once surfing incorporates those two compulsory um, moves. So you have your artistic moves and then the, the must do moves, right? You got to have the perfect ripping roundhouse cutback. How perfect is your roundhouse cutback compared to the next rider on that wave? So if it's 6.0, that guy came pretty close to the perfect figure eight. He drew almost that perfect figure eight. That is about a five. Okay. But if you're just mm -hmm. doing a cutback and then a little tail, so you set two sets of judging criteria. And I think that surfing will get there like figure skating, like it is now with snowboarding in the half pipe. For those people who are listening, who are beginner or intermediate or future surfers, what is the optimal path to learn how to surf? Yeah, you're going to laugh, but watch the movie North Shore. <laughs> North Shore? Yes. <laughs> with Sean Thompson? <laughs> the, with Sean Thompson was in it, wasn't he? Yeah. He's Jerry Lopez and all that. That's yeah. right. That's right. You did watch it. Good for you. So you're on the right path. But <laughs> we used to have uh, mandatory North Shore viewing at surf camp. And the reason we did it, Guy, is because people have this desire to be a, on a shortboard, right? I'm going to learn how yeah. to be a shortboard. I'm going to learn how to be a surfer. But before you get there... In order to develop the best technique, style, surfing with grace, surfing with ease, right? You're not forcing it. You just, you see the best surfers in the water and they just seem like it's effortless, right? In their turns and effortless in the way, get, getting in and out. And the only way to develop those needed skill sets is start with a longboard. You start with a big old longboard, just like they do with the Kahuna in North Shore. He gets there, and the <laughs> shaper gives it. Here, what, what's this? And it's an old box yeah. board from the fifties. He starts going down shorter and shorter. And so, it's really important to start with the right equipment: nose to tail, rail to rail. You have to be able to use a board that can glide you out through the surf, get through the white water maintain your position, flip around and catch a wave and do it a thousand times. Not that I'm an expert, but it seems to me that the way many people surf is they have a friend who is a good surfer, inevitably a short border. Yeah. And so they say to the guy or the gal, you know, I want to learn how to surf. And the guys or the gals <laughs> on a five foot, you know, yeah. short board. Right. And so the, that expert says, yeah, you know, you need to start on a long board. Get a seven-foot board. Mm -hmm. Or maybe go to Costco and get a mm -hmm. wave start. Mm -hmm. And tell me if I'm right or wrong, but I think that for most people, you should start on a 10-foot board. Yeah. Well, and well, what do you use in the surf school? We use a 10-foot surf text. We use yeah. the, the surf tech that has that nice soft epoxy deck. Yeah. It has a, a, a epoxy bottom that's a rigid bottom. It's really the best learner board. We put some people on a 12 foot mm. soft top. I have a 12 foot. <laughs> I ride a 12 foot. I have a 12 foot soft top and I ride it all the time because it develops that better style. All of a sudden, how easy it is, is it to take the, your little like step one forward, step two back, step one forward, step two back. So you learn to develop that cross step technique that you can't do on a, a nine foot board when you first start. So we use a lot of long boards in the surf school. In fact, I've seen children, about a 12 year old kid starts on a long board before the end of the week, he's already on a, a six foot sponge. <laughs> little little fish and ripping because he was so dedicated to making sure that he could control that long board. He used the nose, tail, rail to rail. He used the whole long board. He was able to motion, move himself up, begin to cross step, and then move back, turn. That big 12-footer, 
you tried turning that thing from the center of the board. You're not going to go anywhere. The board's going to go yeah. straight. You're going to go through the board. So I, I yeah. once had a conversation with Bob Pearson and I asked him in your career as a shaper, have you ever told anybody that they're ordering too long a board? And he said, Nope. <laughs> so true. And I think there's a renaissance happening right now with the longboard movement. And I see so many new surfers out there with the Costco, which it, it's a great board to start on because it's safe. It's not going to give you a big rail to the face. And it's safe for other surfers too. You know, here's a beginner out there and a bunch of beginners are running each other over and they're, they're okay, right? But a Costco <laughs> surfer isn't going to go out and get a custom yeah. short board. So I think there's a movement in longboard surfing. And I see it at the contest. Like, there's as many women and men in longboarding in some of these specialty events, more than some of the shortboard NSSA challenger events. And there's a movement because what I think is happening, guy, I think these girls and guys are getting out there with their friends. They're learning how, how to ride that, that Costco board. And then they go out and they buy themselves a used longboard. And then if they continue to surf on that used longboard and they get proficient where you get out of the soup and yep. you begin to slide, right? Now you're, now the game is on. Now you've yep. begun this rail to rail technology. Now the game is on. So if they stick with it, they might get a custom longboard. I don't think they're going to go and buy a custom shortboard. I think they're going to stay away from that. They might get a midsize, but I think longboarding in general and longer surfboards is is making a huge comeback do you believe in the theory that the best surfer is the surfer out there who's having the most fun well i i do honest to god i, I have to say there's some guys on tour right now that are so remarkable and the tour is so different and you see them gracefully losing out of the top 32 on tour and you know like they, how, how many came in and that lost and you see some of the real champions that are gracefully bowed out of the competition and you, you see it with some of the the guys that are in, in the pack at malibu they're smiling they don't care if a guy drops in behind them in front of them and i always thought that surfing was <laughs> in my opinion joyous occasion, right? You're out there, you're smiling. People used to paddle up to me, hey, Pascoach, why are you always smiling? Because I know I can catch every wave I need to catch in my session and you can go surf with me and I don't care if you're in front of me or behind me. It's like, it's challenging. And surfing has always been an amazing connection. And I just think that the if you're having fun out there and you're not, you're not out there with the eyes, I mean, I could play that. You want to go you know, I'll paddle out at lowers on my longboard all of a sudden all these smiling faces turn her <laughs> <laughs> longboarder go surf Saturn free put right on the, right after my session Paskowitz go surf Sano <laughs> so you know there's a there's a there's a shortboard mentality I think that's developing because there's so many young kids where the dad's paddling out and pushing them into waves they've got these little three foot you know potato chips and then you go down a little bit to middles and there's like two or three long borders all hey bud what's up hey that you know everyone's all cool and then i don't know i have okay. fun and and what about the theory that somehow locals i don't know how you define local and in santa cruz the definition of a local is someone who's been in santa cruz two weeks longer than you but yeah let's say the theory that locals somehow have more rights to waves yeah. than a tourist it's a sad situation but i remember surfing up and down the coast and santa cruz was a big deal we used to get a lot of hassles at Santa Cruz at Steamer Lane, especially Steamer. And we would pull up in the camper with 25 surfboards on top. And then my dad, <laughs> and my dad would be like, okay, of course, Jonathan and Izzy gets to paddle out with dad. Only three at a time he would send out. They would go out and he would deal with a crowd and he'd talk and good morning. And he'd, he's always very polite. And, and the only locals out there are the creatures that have been a part of that environment for much longer than some of the writers. So I personally don't 
think that the locals have any other rights. Now, you paddle out Hawaii, you paddle out North Shore, you you could get yourself in big trouble. You you start <laughs> comparing yourself to a local, right? Yeah. But I always say, you know, though my brothers that want to go surf at a special place, I always say, look, give respect to the locals. Get respect. Paddle up to the guy in Santa Cruz, whether it's one of the local bad boys or guys that have been there forever that claim Steamer Lane as their own. Good morning. Just how you doing? Say hi. He's going to go over very well or very bad. <laughs> And you know, okay, I'll just back off, you know. Well, I, I think the equivalent today is you pull up the steamer lane, driving a Tesla with mm-hmm. five wave storms on your roof. That, mm-hmm. would, be, <laughs> that would be a non-starter. <laughs> okay, but if it's six foot and it's offshore and it's howling, those guys aren't going to get to the outside. You put yeah. this preconceived notion in your head and you're like, oh, look at you kooks. Look at these kooks. These guys have as much right to get out there and enjoy the ocean as any of the locals. First of all, they're not going to get outside on a wave storm. They're not, you can't (laughs) duck dive a wave storm. You can't stay in the pit. You're going to take off. You're going to eat it. You're not going to, and maybe it's because I love so much to be a part of that camaraderie. And I was raised in Hawaii with that kind of camaraderie. And we never stayed in one place too long after we moved to the mainland. And there was always some great camaraderie as along the coast. The East Coast is amazing, and the Gulf of <laughs> Texas is amazing. Wow. New York, Rhode Island, all those beautiful places. You you only get those that heavy local spots in, in a few little designated zones. North side of the pier, Huntington Beach, you get a couple crazies there. Obviously, you know, Surf City, Santa Cruz, you get some very, you know, <laughs> wild. My, my, one of my favorite all-time lines in any movie any movie at all <laughs> is in north shore when the guy says he's so holly he don't know he's holly i mean <laughs> oh right yeah <laughs> but see that's it though because anyone could have this special talent you have this kid from arizona who all of a sudden you wake up <laughs> and and you just want to be a surfer right and he should be able to follow his dream. And when he's in Hawaii, he thinks he's he's non howly right? I mean, howly <laughs> just, it means tourist, right? It's just, it, it's not like a real detrimental term, but it just means you're a tourist. And hey, if you weren't born in Hawaii, you're kind of a howly. We were howlies and we were born in Hawaii. But yeah, my dad's yeah. Russian, my mom's Mexican. And yeah. somehow we got the eyes and we... <laughs> Did okay, but I I can give you lessons in pigeon if it. <laughs> oh my gosh, my dad help. my my dad dated it when we were he he's like don't speak that no clap no clip he's like don't speak that. <laughs> Wait, did he teach you Yiddish? <laughs> yeah, there was a lot okay. of Yiddish. There was a lot of yeah. Yiddish. There was a lot of Hebrew. Some of the boys went to Israel and got bar mitzvah and spoke Hebrew. My brother Jonathan, he could speak did, fluent Hebrew. Did any David. of you serve in the IDF? Uh, serve? No, no. No, we, no, you didn't no. do the two years because going back to the homeland and all that? You, they wouldn't even let my dad serve. He wanted us to. What was huh. interesting is because we couldn't serve, and you're talking really young kids at this time, he developed some lifeguard training. And those early adopters of the surfers became the early lifeguards. And they would teach people about the rip currents. And we'd go to these far off beaches in Israel and we would be the only lifeguards. And he had us train with the lifeguards at 13 years old. You you, you know, big swell. You got to swim out around through the run. The same thing that, that the Americans, because he was a lifeguard when he was 16 years old in Mission Beach. And a lot of people don't realize my dad migrated from Texas, Galveston Island, Texas, where he fell in love with surfing, where the early lifeguards back in those days had these like blow up, um, they look like he called them hot dogs. It was like a blow up hot dog. They would swim out with this hot dog and then and the, the person having trouble would hold on to it and they would swim him in. And you're talking, I don't know, he's like 40s. And he had this idea that he would strap 
three or four together. And then he started riding the, the breakwater, the backwash out to sea. And that's where he first learned how to surf. And then he moved to wow. Mission Beach. He was in Mission Beach High School in the early, late 40s. And that's where he became a lifeguard for the first time. Up next on Remarkable People. And I think that the stigma and the early representation of surfers really took a turn to the left right because you had these guys were, were, the, surfing wasn't popularized at all until malibu right hello i'm jane goodall and i just want to tell you that i've been on a guy's podcast twice now and had a great time and i really hope that you'll listen to it of course especially the one when i'm on but the other is great too you're listening to remarkable people with Guy Kawasaki. So, Kelly Slater, the Kelly Slater, greatest of all time, was an instructor for you. Yeah. So, was it just head and shoulders so obvious this guy is going to be the greatest of all time, or was he just like another surfer and you're amazed that he progressed to where he is? It was those early trips to Florida that we saw the culture of surfing, especially in like Cocoa Beach, for instance. Cocoa Beach had this lifestyle culture of surfing and all these great young kids like Todd Holland and, and, and the Slater family because Kelly's the the middle brother, right? So Sean, the older brother, was really the, the, the first one of the Slaters to really get in there. And my dad noticed these little kids and he just fell in love with them and the mom, Judy, and how we related to them. And he just knew that there was something special in the family. And Kelly would come to the West Coast and stay in San Clemente, and he would come down to see Doc because they just hit it off. Doc always believed that Kelly had everything that it takes to be a superstar, the dedication, the attitude of mind, the uh, commitment, the discipline. He saw something in that at an early age. And when Kelly was at the West Coast, he would see Doc. He would come down and work the surf school for just, you know, a day or two. Or, you know, at that point, he was getting pretty famous. And so it was kind of hard. Everyone wanted a picture of Kelly. My dad definitely saw something special in him. And they became friends until my dad was in his 80s. And, and, um, 90s in Hawaii. My favorite picture ever is my dad and Kelly sitting in the, on some longboards at Waikiki, just talking. Huh? Yeah. Uh huh. Do you, do you have that picture? Yeah, yeah. It's in our family archives. I, I have that picture. It's Rob Machado's in it as well. Rob's another amazing surfer that emulates what that lifestyle that Doc really took to heart, which was you know the health nutrition yeah. can, can you send me a copy of that picture to use for when your podcast goes live oh yeah absolutely i'll se- i'll send you a couple of the amazing images just for some reason doc had this hindsight that we were doing something special so yeah he always had cameras in fact he wrote to canon when they came up with the first underwater camera And they sent this film and there was a super eight underwater camera that they they used to give us free and we developed the film for free. So he always had this great love of filmmaking and fit and photos. And so we have some amazing early archival pictures and, and, and later ones too. Send them, send them, whatever you got. I'll take some with you too, of course. (laughs) uh, One of my favorite (laughs) shots is just us being Pasco. It's just, walking in the middle of nowhere in Mexico with a fishing pole or pushing the camper across a river. And Doc set up a camera somewhere in the middle of the desert just (laughs) to capture that one image, you know? So if if someone is listening to this and they're not surfers, they never surf, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's not the converted like I am. Can you just explain to them why people like you and I just love surfing. I swear, if I had taken up surfing when I was young, I would not be where I am in terms of my career. There's no doubt in my mind. So can you explain why? Is that a detrimental? 
effectively. Financially, for sure. <laughs> I would be an instructor right now at your school. So mm -hmm. what? How, how do you explain just the magic of surfing to people? Mm. That's such an intrepid question because I was born and raised in Hawaii with the gods of surfing, the, the real ancient Hawaiian families that lived there and that were a part of the Kealana family and the Achoi family and Moniz. And, and you just see this light that emanates from them. Um, the early surfers that Doc surfed with, like George Downing and, and Wally Forsyth and some of the pioneers in California. And there was this pull for these individuals. And I think there's this little rebel in human nature. And, and it gives you that freedom to rebel against everything you were taught. Go to school, get an education, get a good, buy a house, get good credit, find a wife, put up that picket fence. And I think in a way, when you get out there on the board and you're paddling around, you're free. There's nothing restricting you. It's just you and the ocean. And I think there's an allure to that. And you could say the same thing about maybe mountain climbers or, or, or sailors, that there's an allure to it. And I think for people that look at the ocean and fear it, but yet they still surf. I think they get that satisfaction that there's something that lies undiscovered out there. And I want a piece of that. And I think that's what gets people to try surfing for the first time is that little rebel in them that says, oh, you know what? I'm tired of being a average marketing director guy. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to go grab a surfboard and rebel against. I, you know what? I need something to stir the cockles of my heart, you know? Grab my wave storm, jump in my Tesla Hell and go. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> like, look at me, man. I ain't going to work. I'm going to surf and see these boards on top. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One last question. I have noticed that just about every surfing movie – has kind of a reoccurring theme. And I want you to address, is this necessarily a good thing, a bad thing? Is it representative of the culture? But in so many surfing movies, it starts off with misspent youth, doesn't do well in school, finds his love and passion and freedom surfing, gets hooked on drugs, one of his peers dies, then you interview the guy's spouse, you interview other surfers who surfed against him, how he was a great guy, but drugs took him over. Like, yeah. have I not just described just about every surfing movie? Is, is that how it has to be? Unfortunately, it is. I just came across, I don't know, The Surfer or something with Matthew McConaughey, and I almost yeah. couldn't even watch it. It was just so hideous. And, and I think that, the stigma and the early representation of surfers really took a turn to the left, right? Because you had these guys were, were th surfing wasn't popularized at all until Malibu, right? All of a sudden you had this, this little girl who decided to surf. So tube steak, Tracy, the Kahuna from North of Laguna, you look at that girl midget. What's this girl midget? And they start calling her Gidget. That's Kathy Zuckerman. Kathy Zuckerman's father was a movie producer. He sold the deal to Hollywood to make Gidget. As soon as Gidget came out, they portrayed those guys who some were, some weren't. Debaucherous profligates who were drinking <laughs> all day, smoking all night, taking advantage of the women, surfing, not going to school, not going to work, not doing that. And I think that stigma has lasted And it has been imbued into the focal point of surfing for so many decades that Hollywood just took it over, put it out there for everybody to feed off of. And then, unfortunately, it went full circle 
when the skating community came out because these were young skaters that were just surfers. They're like, let's go break into a backyard and skate a pool. So you had these like early rebels that were taking it to the next level of, and all of a sudden they became superstars like the early Z boys in Dogtown, and, and just amazing how that, that the whole world just glommed onto this like bad boy image of surfing. And I think that stereotype really, really took a a global advantage of what surfing can really be. Look, if they were interested in in the real surfing history and the mana that would come with the the kings who would surf against the other king, and they were the only ones allowed to go out there and battle the waves together, and the the winner would come in, and then they would have this great feast. And it was pure, and and, and nobody wants to hear that. Nobody's interested in the <laughs> in the good parts of surfing and the love and the camaraderie and the joy and, and this elation of mind, body, and spirit. That's boring. They want to hear about the bad boys that would go and you see some of the TV shows. Like, I don't even know what it's called. The surfers are portrayed as gangsters, right? Or drug addicts. Oh, with, and- with Keanu Reeves? Was, that <laughs> it? was it Keanu Reeves? Well, yeah. Were well, they bank robbers? Right. Well, he was the cop, who, uh, Point Break. Right. Oh, point. Oh, he was the cop. Okay. Yeah. He got involved with the bank robbers who were thrill junkies, right? They were the (laughs) surfers. They just needed that adrenaline. So they would, yeah. But I don't know, guy. I love surfing. I sell surfing products. I I have mandatory surf days. I work for my van on, on Friday. I designed my life. So surfing is so important to my everyday spirit. I check the waves every day. I don't have time to surf every day, but I do make it mandatory when the waves are up. I get out there. I've taken the importance of always learning to a very good place where I got my first prototype epoxy board. It's an amazing step up. I I try to get on my handboard every day to practice my land surfing. It's so important to me to constantly be improving and constantly be learning. You know, next time you want to surf, you want to get better, try that 12 footer on a small day and do a bunch of cross stepping and just step back on that tail and move that big old beast around, you know? So it's really important to constantly be learning and constantly be challenging yourself and feel like you're you each session you came back with a little fleck of gold you know okay this is a, <laughs> something i can put in my cache <laughs> clearly you're talking about surfing but isn't everything you just said applicable to all of life truly right every day you have some joy you make an improvement you get a fleck of gold but you're also trying to improve every time you do something yeah what's wrong with that as a life philosophy right well doesn't make a lot of money (laughs) 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 and that's here lies the problem i know a lot of miserable rich people abraham i know a lot of miserable rich people i know i know and it's sad because a lot of people they don't have that opportunity and something snapped in your brain where all of a sudden you were in your 60s and you wanted to learn how to surf, right? Yes. So something wasn't there. You could have said, I want to be a golfer. I want to be a tennis guy. I want to learn how to do lacrosse. I want croquet. I want mountain climbing, whatever. Bowling. (laughs) Bowling, yeah. (laughs) But something got you into that. And I think that, you know, I I guess I'm a, a, a hopeless optimist in a way that I really take on that like attitude like hey what can i do today to give back because i love what i do so much and i do what i love so much and i just i got that to that place where i just feel like all the hard times that i put into it and all the struggles that we had not being educated not being able to go to school not being able to get into a college not being able to be a doctor which i wanted to be that I found my place by just sticking with it and finding that calmness that came when I paddled out. Maybe I'll Mm -hmm. find out if Pat O'Neill listens to this podcast, but 
I have several of your wetsuits, and I just love your wetsuits. And I have your handboard. I love your handboard. So thank you for the products you've made and for the knowledge you've passed along to me. And you've already helped my pop up be better. And I saw <laughs> that it worked. <laughs> I, I am here to improve your surfing. So that's Abraham Paskowitz from the first family of surfing, son of Doc and Juliet Paskowitz. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Maybe it'll make you a remarkable surfer. I'm Guy Kawasaki. This is Remarkable People. I'm on a mission to make you remarkable. Helping me is Peg Fitzpatrick, Jeff C., Shannon Hernandez, Madison, the drop-in queen of Santa Cruz, Nismer, I hope Abraham doesn't teach her how to surf better. Luis Magana and Alexis Nishimura. Until next time, mahalo and aloha. This is Remarkable People.